<laughs> Jim Barry, who I think is probably our newest member joining us. Um, Bob Gwynn won't need an introduction to many of you because he's spoken at Newcomen events in the past. As you may know, he's a, a curator at the National Railway Museum in York. He's also, although he denies it strongly, something of a TV celebrity. Uh, most nights you can catch him on BBC Four or Channel Five, and his latest filming uh, this month is for is for Channel Five. He's also a stalwart of uh, the Langothlan Railway and the Daniel Adamson Trust, as many of you will know from the Newcomen website, where where the problems of those two trusts during lockdown are featured. And uh, perhaps most impressive of all. He comes to us having recently cycled from Land's End to John O'Groats during a furlough, which is a, a truly remarkable achievement. Tonight, Bob's going to talk to us about the famous flying spots, marketing, circumstance and chance. Bob, the floor is all yours. Brilliant. Well, uh, hello, everyone. It's really kind of weird to be on a Zoom talk. I've not done this before, but we'll give it a go. So we're going to talk about flying Scotsman marketing circumstance and chance really what this is about is why is flying scotsman so famous that's what my talk is about let's see what we can say about that well when you hear the name flying scotsman ask yourself do you picture this i mean that would have been the flying scotsman until the start of covid actually um the flying scotsman is currently suspended uh, have that on very fine authority, um, but it will come back in March and it will come back with one of these fundamentally Shinkansens, the IET trains. Or do you picture this? This is, of course, Flying Scotsman in its heyday in the 1930s, although, of course, the locomotive on the front is not Flying Scotsman, which confuses quite a lot of people. Or do you picture this, which is fine dining, which is going along with Flying Scotsman and, and just enjoying um, the scene, you know, and um, all that kind of thing. Do you, do you picture this kind of thing? Um, well, if you think about Flying Scotsman, um, it's been a train since 1862. So it's been a train a long time, been in the timetable a long time. It's only been a locomotive named Flying Scotsman since 1924. And here it is in one of its, well, about 20 years ago incarnations at Scarborough on the turntable. So the name in the, of the locomotive and the name of the train caused lots of confusion. And that's why today the locomotive, this was its first run after its recent restoration in 2016. This is what so Gary Verity said. This is part of history. You only have to look at the crowds. They're on every vantage point, every gantry, every bridge, even on cherry pickers. You ain't kidding. That train was completely rammed all the way. And frankly, uh, it caught me something of, a, um, of some palpitations because I was in a public car park tuned directly into uh, the local radio station ready to talk about it, hoping that it didn't run anybody over between uh, London King's Cross and York because, frankly, I knew that there would be people all over the place. And in fact, they did have to slow down for trespasses en route. So the train, just reminding ourselves, well, up until 2020, it was the 0540, it was still in the timetable, the flagship service of, of the current incarnation of London Northeastern Railway, right? And the author, Andrew Martin, who went on this in 2014, he asked people on the train, he said, well, what do you, you know, this flying Scotsman, this person said, said it turned out that yes he always traveled on the scotsman he didn't know it was a scotsman because it felt like an ordinary train and in fact by 2020 if you've been on that train uh, earlier this year uh, all you would know is it stopped at newcastle really and it's in the timetable and that's about it they didn't really make a lot of it but vtech uh, virgin trains east coast um, deliberately turned out this uh, scenery saying on the side of the thing saying world famous since 1924 which ties into when they actually named the train the flying scotsman but if we think about these things um and uh just looking at 
how many locomotives Britain actually built during its time, 640,000 locomotives, 110,000 built in Britain, 34,000 built in British Railway Works. So there was a, a lot of locomotives built, not really a surprise, and we had the empire to supply. Basically, you didn't buy off, off us, you could get lost. Uh, and um, not really surprised that this statistics, by the way, come from um, Mr. Atkins, who used to be the uh, librarian at the museum, the, the railway museum. So by 2015, when they did this poll, um, Flying Scotsman topped the poll of the world's best known trains and locomotives. I think that's called hedging your bets, actually, because the museum gets very iffy about people calling trains locomotives and locomotives trains. But frankly, out there now, uh, most uh, trains are trains. There's very few locomotive hauled services left on the network. Anyway, here it is. The most famous train in the world, or to the media, most of the public, the most, most famous train, the most famous locomotive, but they hedge their best. Um, why is this so? Why, why, why is this when you do a poll? Well, when they did the four trains event to uh, launch um, the new trains and they had Flying Scotsman there and so on, I'll just go back to that one. Um, they, they were already up with that particular statistic. So they said, well, fine, we'll go with it and we will have all four of the most famous uh, on this route together. So they had a 91, one of these new trains, a HST and Flying Scotsman. Of course, all the enthusiasts complained, where's the Deltic? There's no Deltic. So they brought a Deltic into York as well, just to make everybody happy. And um, this was a big launch, you know, Worth the money, they've got primetime TV out of it, Flying Scotsman, you're pushing at an open door if you go to the media with that particular name. Why? Well, just remember, PR has always been important to railway companies. Here's a, 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 a loco from 1903. Now, I'd like to see a preserved railway do this, where they actually advertise their services on the side tank of the locomotive as it rolled into Pickering or something. I think there'd be apoplexy among some of the photographers, but this is, you know, this is 1903, and um, um, on the side of the loco, if you're waiting for a commuter train in London, you've got an advert on the side of the tank engine pulling the loco, saying, you know, travel on the East Coast Main Line, you know, it's an express route to East Coast. So PR has always been around on railways, because otherwise, how do you fill the trains? One of the ways you, you celebrate your, your journeys, maybe buying a postcard, here's the flying Scotchman. Scotch and Scots. It's one of those big arguments between English. Uh, it doesn't go down well if you ask for, you know, a, a, a Scotch and soda in, in Scotland. If you're in a malt bar, you know, it won't work. But anyway, here it is. Roaring along in the days of the Great Northern. Um, and it's long been associated with speed. So here's an advert from 1891. And these are all the kind of pens you could buy from this pen manufacturer in Edinburgh. The Waverley pen, the Pickwick, the Owl pen, the Flying Scotsman pen, the Flying Dutchman pen, and of course the, the Hindu pen. But the Flying Scotsman pen, the fastest pen we have ever used, according to the Sportsman newspaper. So it's already there in the consciousness and actually you know, in marketing terms, sort of product extension. We've all already, it's gone beyond being just a name. It's spread out into the, the general universe of what people do, and it's associated with speed. Um, here's a train, Night Ride on the Flying Scotsman. This is a Strand magazine in 1892. Now, the, the guy who wrote this article, which is excellent, you can get it um, if you know where to look online, describes a footplate ride on a Stirling single in 1892. And of course, it scares the living daylights out of the, the, um, the author, F.G. Kitten, who was an expert on Dickens, amongst other things. As they're roaring along, uh, you know, in the night, the driver shouts in his ear, you are now traveling as fast as anyone ever did travel, I think, 75 miles an hour. What Kitten actually remarks when he gets off at uh, London, he's scared, witless, really, is that the driver and fireman just climb off the engine, say bye, and walk off, because it's just a daily occurrence from just a part of their everyday occurrence. But by that stage, Scotsman is in 
you know, the language. It's in the places where people want to read magazines and so on. And if you think about it, the railways are part of the UK DNA. Here's some recent headlines. You know, tax bills being shunted into sidings, hitting the buffers. Has gold price run out of steam? Well, probably not, actually, folks. But, you know, that kind of, these kind of things are all over in the language. You can get to about 20 plus phrases which relate directly to railways. It's not really surprising. But the question that I posed, you know, a while back when I first did this particular talk to um, a university um, was, is Flying Scotsman a brand? Well, here's another green cylinder that very definitely is a brand. A sign, symbol, words, combination of these, creating an image that identifies a product and differentiates it from its competitors. Its competitors, very important. You know, Scotsman is another household name in green cylindrical form. Think about it. And this one you might have on your, on your shelf at home. So Scotsman definitely is a brand, particularly its heyday. Very much so. And here it is in its heyday, climbing out of King's Cross on the Flying Scotsman with Flying Scotsman. And how did it get to there? Well, it starts being named first off, at the British Empire Exhibition in 1924. That's, it runs around for a year or so with, with, um, with no name, and then they decide to buckle to uh, um, popular appeal and adapt what has become basically a nickname for the 10 o'clock departure that goes non-stop, well, didn't until um, later, but that goes as fast as they can up to Edinburgh and the one that returns from Edinburgh always known as a flying Scotsman because, of course, in those days, even before you could fly, flying along was going quickly. And it takes it to the Empire Exhibition. Of course, the Empire Exhibition, what's that about? Well, it's, it's, it's basically a massive um, promotion for the British Empire, which, of course, because of the um, First World War, you know, a lot of money had been spent, a lot of people had been killed, they needed a recruitment. So they have this huge show in Wembley. I mean, this was the largest concrete building in Britain at the time. And Scotsman is right in the middle of it, polished up. And they've applied a name to it, which is the name of the principal service, the 10 o'clock, which they finally decided to name the Flying Scotsman. Um, and here it is. And it's seen by over 26 million visitors. Um, and of course, what do we get out of uh, the uh, British Empire exhibition? Well, two things. One is we get Flying Scotsman, the locomotive named Flying Scotsman after the train. The other is we get Wembley Stadium. And Wembley Stadium, of course, becomes the home of football. So you get Wembley. You say somebody to the street, Wembley, they'll say, oh, football. Say Flying Scotsman, they'll say locomotive. Well, or train, probably. And then... Um, by the time this show opens, there's 21 years of Empire Days been going on to celebrate the marvels of the British Empire. But of course, the service has been running since 1862. But the LNR, which is that stage, only a year, year old as this conglomeration has decided to name the locomotive Flying Scotsman, put it on display. Uh, if you went to the Empire Exhibition, you had other things you could see, um, apart from you know, kind of weird human zoo style, you know, you could go in a Nigerian village and this kind of thing. You could also go on the shows and rides and things. And the, the Canadians, for some reason, had a giant sculpture made out of butter. Uh, you know, all that kind of thing was going on. Um, and at the end of this show, uh, the Daily Mail, bless them, decided to set loudspeakers up in all the public squares of the whole of Britain because there was a new medium uh, you know mass medium had got had gone into place by this stage which was radio and the, the, they asked the the, the uh, king to provide the end closing speech and the poor old king said i'm not doing it he gave it to his second son who of course had a stammer bertie and bertie's speech was apparently painful to listen to so if you watch the king's speech it was the closing speech uh, that meant that the guy who taught the guy who subsequently became king um, after, after the other one had abdicated, um, 
how to pronounce and uh, get over his stammer. So um, the King's speech spins out of that as well. Anyway, you very swiftly have um, products that relate to Flying Scotsman. Here's um, a model you could buy on the, when you were there. The locomotive gets known as the Wembley engine. And um, at this stage, of course, uh, you've got intercompany rivalry and there's two 10 o'clock departures. You can go to Euston, get the Royal Scot, or you can go to King's Cross and get the Flying Scotsman. So there's lots of benefits to actually uh, promoting this as a kind of the premier brand, not least because the LNER is mostly broke in these days and ran an awful lot of old rolling stock. So if you can promote something that gives your brand a bit of glamour, then why don't you do it? Because these years, the interwar years, are troublesome. Norman McKillop's uh, history of the Aslef is interesting because it's got Flying Scotsman on the right-hand side in blue, which was one of the colours the locomotive has carried. But of course, by 1919, you've had the eight-hour day. You know, the railwaymen have, have fought to get an eight-hour day guarantee. You've already had a national strike of locomen. Uh, you get into the major recessions and they agree cutting wages to try and make sure more people actually uh, stay in employment. Um, and these are, this is the year of the isms, the nationalism, Bolshevism, socialism, fascism, major economic depression. So if you can actually promote your service, then it's a good idea because um, it's going to make you money. And political, economic, social, technical analysis on the name Flying Scotsman, you can do it. Here's Cramlington, which was the worst um, incident of the general strike, or it happened a little bit beforehand. The locomotive, incidentally, was the Mary Hampton, and they'd removed a rail to try and stop the coal trains running at Cramlington. Nobody was actually killed in this incident, but it was easily the worst incident of the general strike. Uh, had anybody been killed, then the people responsible would have been hung. Um, incidentally, by the way, those days, it, uh, juries, you had to own a property to be on a jury. So there was no way these people were going to be judged by the people from their area. Um, but, you know, general strike, three million are on strike. Um, the miners around here starved back to work after nine months, which is quite familiar if you know the long history of the UK. Um, but this is a period when the LNER's revenue is just half. They just, you know, you've got shares in the company, you aren't doing very well. And of course, they had more four wheel and six wheel carriages in service than any other railway. And in fact, the, the chief mechanical engineer came up with a brilliant wheeze where he put two of the six wheel carriages onto one. Uh, ordinary uh, underframe, so they didn't have to build more carriages. So it wasn't necessarily um, a great place for, for, for passengers, but you could big up the Flying Scotsman. And Cecil Dandridge, of course, carried on the work of his predecessor, advertising manager, William Teasdale, who by this stage is assistant general manager. So advertising is getting all it can. And he um, writes, even in his advertising notes, those responsible for railway advertising must be thoroughly detached from railway routine. The point of view of the public must be the first consideration. Every member of the public must be a potential traveller. And part of that is, well, make it look nice if you possibly can. So one of the ruses they come up with is the non-stop 1928. And this is one of the ruses that basically everybody still talks about to this day if you think about it it's quite a thing it's two train crews over 200 signalmen and you've got to work as a team to deliver this it's not easy um eight hours 15 minutes who uses the hairdresser is a good question uh there's a cocktail bar on board but it's still famous the actual uh, corridor tender, Mr. Eggleshaw from Doncaster Works, who does it, um, if you think about it, what's it for? Well, it's so that the crews can change over. Are they really that bothered about uh, crew comfort in those days? Well, the timetable set for uh, the train to take the journey was agreed after the uh, races to the north in 1895. So the timing was 8 hours, 15 minutes. So you can either see the, tent, uh, the corridor tender as a P 
piece of technology or you can see it as a sop to the unions because they just won the eight hour day so you couldn't drive eight hours 15 minutes is it team building or union power in that tender good question and everybody of course forgets that the lms the big rivals sent this compound loco three days before the non-stop service worked from king's cross as a spoiler and here it is arriving in Edinburgh. I mean, don't ask how the crews uh, got on for toilet facilities. That's not a good question. Um, but here they're arriving in Edinburgh, 399 miles nonstop with a shortened uh, uh, train. I'd love to know how they kept the lubrication going on this for that led to journey, but they succeeded three days before. But everybody's forgotten this one. They always remember the nonstop the L and E R nonstop because it had a hairdressing saloon and there's punch, you know, a lampooned in 1928. When the barber wants to make a quick job of it, he asks the driver to go so fast the customer's hair stands on end, so they're all ready to be cut. Wouldn't work with me, of course, but I mean to say in those days, you know, um, you could get a Marcel wave. If you're wondering what a Marcel wave is, it well, it's not that guy from France who used to do the the gestures in front of a front of a mirror. This is a Marcel Wave with Mary Pickford. Um, actually, weirdly, gentlemen could get a shave on board. Um, though only four people did on the first journey. Well, the Grizzly bogey is not that good, and you might want to choose your moment if you think about it. Think of all the points and crossings. You know, you, these were cutthroat ravers. I mean, yeah, anyway, the point was... Effectively, it's a loss leader. I mean, how many people are going to say, well, I'll, I won't get my hair done until I get that express train to Edinburgh? Not many. But um, it's a loss leader, and it got the headlines. And it's so potent that um, people remember it today. Incidentally, you could have a flying Scotsman cocktail. Now, this made a bit more sense to me, because it's 8 hours, 15 minutes on the train. And this is, you know... Um, Two ounces of sweet vermouth and two ounces of Scotch whiskey and some ice in a glass. It, it tastes like cough mixture, uh, but you're bound to go asleep shortly afterwards. So, you know, sup one of those by the time you're going through Doncaster and you might wake up somewhere beyond Berwick, which is about right, I would think, because uh, you've got over eight hours on the train. But the l and &ER start promoting it, and this is what they do through their press adverts. l and &ER, London, non-stop Edinburgh route. It puts a shine on everything they're doing. Eric Gill, the famous artist, uh, really not worth reading his Wikipedia page, but he's a very famous artist and rather nice artist, but um, the most famous of all traveling hotels. And he actually, of course, invents Gill Sands. So this whole presentation is done in Gill Sands, which the l &ER adopts, which is part of their corporate branding before anybody had really talked about corporate branding. And he hand-painted a headboard for the Flying Scotsman. In fact, Flying Scotsman headboards, headboards on trains, comes in with the first Flying Scotsman train running from Edinburgh down to London with shot over on the front because headboards were a North British uh, development. They were something you saw around Edinburgh. They weren't seen the rest of the network until Flying Scotsman non-stop started running. By the time you get to uh, this period, here's a poster you don't need to do anything other than put a big wing off the back of the train to say, it's the Flying Scotsman. It's a glamorous way to travel. You know, it, it, you know, it takes you off to somewhere nice, takes you into the sunset. And they start doing um, uh, placements with celebrities, celebrity placement. I mean, to say, you know, it's still out there now uh, as a thing, you know. Um, um, and here's Sir Malcolm Campbell, the fastest man in the world, shaking hands with driver Sparshat, who at that stage was a whip and driver, and one of the fastest drivers the LNER had. Um, uh, he must have had, um, uh, well, I'd, I think his, his blood had been removed and replaced with a serum that felt no fear because um, some of the exploits he got up to were incredible, considering that these locomotives had no in cab signaling whatsoever. There's no ATC in them, and the amount of um, Signal placements you've got, even going through somewhere like Doncaster's about, I don't know, 25, something like that. Um, so quite impressive. But here's Sparshat with uh, Sir Malcolm Campbell. And it becomes a short time, just like, 
you know, a vacuum cleaver cleaner, you know, isn't known as a Hoover. It, you know, if you've had a great trip and you're going on a holiday, your postcard says that I've just arrived by train. So you're right back to your granny, just arrived by train. Middle of the picture, it's Flying Scotsman. It never went to Blackpool. It didn't go to Blackpool until it got into the preservation near the loco. It hit Lockery. Never went near Pitlock. It didn't get there till about 2000, uh, to my knowledge. And, but nonetheless, it's, it's, it's giving you that sense that here is a train. Here's a, here's a, a thing that, that is a great way to travel. And, you know, it's, it's associated with that name. And you very swiftly get products coming out. So if you're going to make a model and you're an ex-cleaner from Normantin, you make it a flying Scotsman out of cardboard. This is in the museum's collection. As left's women's branch... Uh, 1938, um, it's got Flying Scotsman in Empire condition on it. If you buy toffees in 32, it comes in a Flying Scotsman tin. I guarantee somewhere there's a Flying Scotsman tin of toffees available now. Um, by this stage, the l and is going full on, so they're selling you a, a, a guidebook. Not a bad idea, considering how long the time it takes to be on that train. But they're calling it the world's most famous train. I mean... Other people would have disputed that, but who's going to argue, really? And, of course, you inevitably get train sets. It's almost Christmas, so, you know, why don't you buy a train set for your, you know, your dearest little child to, to play in the, uh, in, the, in the front room, although probably you'd get locked in the back room and Dad would play with it in the front room. Uh, <clears throat> you know, a very expensive item in the interwar period. You might be a little bit disappointed when you opened the box. They hadn't quite got to the levels of refinement that Flying Scotsman is now. But nonetheless, there it is. It's available. And if you've got a model railway show, this is um, the, the club's exhibition in 1935, how do you promote it? Well, this is the Daily Herald's photograph. And of course, you get a little kid in shorts and you sit him on a model of Flying Scotsman. What else would you do? If you want to buy a uh, children's book, uh, you know, to read to a little child before they go to sleep, here's uh, Doris Crockford's book from 1937. I'm curious, this book must have been known to J.K. Rowling's because Doris Crockford appears in the Harry Potter books as a character, right? Uh, and this is a colouring book, uh, well, a, you know, colour book where Flying Scotsman gets bored and goes on a holiday, leaves his driver behind. Um, um, Anyway, here it is, 1937. If you go to Scarborough and you have a ride on the train, what's the train look like? Flying Scotsman. Happens to be now the oldest diesel hydraulic in the world, by the way. But in those days, it was very modern. And by the way, it was a bit weird because, of course, it wasn't a steam loco, it was a diesel hydraulic, but made to look like Flying Scotsman. And, of course, you could get a puzzle, Flying Scotsman. Was there no escape? <clears throat> well, good question. This is a poster for the Soviet film, that, a documentary about the building of the Turk Sib um, railway, which um, was one of those. I think they suppressed the Kazakhs with it. I can't quite remember. Anyway, um, and the front of it, well, does look very much like a Gresley engine to me. That does. The real engines look like that, which is nothing like it. But if you think that's odd, well, how about this from the Netherlands? Uh, you know, um, the Dutch, this is from a contemporary uh, Dutch station. Um, they put up a thing on the station saying how, how they moved a, a windmill from Vermenveer to Wienendal. Apologies to any Dutch people out there. But anyway, what did they use to illustrate this? Uh, a picture of Flying Scotsman. Uh, beat that. The, you know, you can go to a bar in Spain, which is called the Flying Scotsman. Um, 1929, the film industry gets in on the act. Now, you can see this film on YouTube. It's absolutely hilarious because it's, the, um, it's where they move over from the, uh, the silent movies to the uh, speaking movies. And they haven't really quite worked out how to do that at this point in time. So um, this is uh, Flying Scotsman, the film. And um, it's, uh, you know, it's got some big ticket people in it. Um, this is Pauline Johnson. She did this twice at a speed of about 40 miles an hour in high heels with no safety net. Um, and is all publicity good? Well, the l and weren't too pleased with this. I mean, it was only a short 
uh, film, it was only kind of quote a quickie thing, but they insisted the credits included the line, dramatic license has been taken for the film purposes and does not represent the actual safety equipment used by the LNER. You'd believe that if you saw the way they split the train without it stopped moving. Anyway, it launched Ray Milan's career, you know, from Flying Scotsman to Battlestar Galactica, via Dial M for Murder and all those other films. Um, by the time they get to 34, they're a bit worried about technology is moving on. Gresley's not a man to uh, not notice technology. He's a CME of the LNER, and he's very interested in new technology. And really, they're wondering how to speed up the services on the East Coast mainline and capture more of the business market. So they use an old A1 to see whether they can really get a bit of speed out of the trains. And the old A1 they choose happens to be Flying Scotsman. So the first authenticated 100 mile an hour by a steam locomotive, important that a steam locomotive is Flying Scotsman in 1934. And the time says it was intended rather as a test of the steam locomotive burning coal on a service similar to those now run in foreign countries by oil fed diesel locomotives. So we don't want any of that nonsense. Anyway, it's a bit of a shame really because I mean the, the Zossen, they'd already done 130 miles an hour with this rather marvellous machine. And at that stage the the fastest scheduled train in the world was uh, the Flying Hamburger, 1933, 77 miles an hour. So the Gresley actually looked to buy um, um, that kit from, from the Germans, but they couldn't guarantee a four-hour service, so they didn't buy. Um, so they turned out the Silver Jubilee instead. And the Silver Jubilee was very impressive uh, in steam terms because uh, it was capable of maintaining that four-hour service, and it immediately broke the records. Um, but think of that image created. Here's the Daily Mail in 2016. And that long reach of that image from the interwar period, um, they haven't reprinted any of their articles where they praise the fascists, mind you, but the long reach of that interwar period in the Daily Mail, once upon a time, guests could enjoy the house cocktail before dinner in a Louis the 16th style dining car. Absolutely true. Followed by a film in the cinema car. Well, actually, no. They only had a cinema car on that service once, in one direction only. Or even a haircut, also true. Although I did meet somebody, a very old man who'd been uh, a um, kitchen boy on the Flying Scotsman. He told me that that nobody went for haircuts and he reckoned that the hairdresser was uh, pretty half cut by the time they passed Doncaster. All this is the world's fastest locomotive. The world's fastest locomotive, well, briefly, clattered between the two main cities of the UK. Well, there we go. Um, that's what Robert Hardman wrote, journalist on the Daily Mail in 2016 when the Scotsman first ran. So that long reach of that publicity created in the 1930s carries on. The locomotive, of course, um, it carried on. It lost its corridor tender in 1936, so it was no longer on the service, the Flying Scotsman, from 1936. So 2836, it's only eight years it's on the service. It's mostly by this stage running up the uh, um, Great Central. Uh, through Leicester. It's briefly shedded at Leicester before it goes back onto the East Coast Main Line. So you might have seen it stomping out of um, Manchester London Road uh, and over Woodhead. Uh, they shed it at Leicester and uh, it's a great story comes out of Leicester which I, I've got time to tell you just briefly that uh, on the way down to London on one occasion the injectors fail on both sides of the loco, a bit of a problem there, and um, they start bailing out the fire bashing the injectors eventually one of them starts and when they get into king's cross they basically say to the um, the shed master just cut the damn thing up it's rubbish they get back to uh, uh leicester they clean out the um filters between the tender and the engine and discover that the filters are blocked not only that but the tender's got something like four live chub living in it because the water for leicester shed came out the river sewer so you know it's uh, you know it's had unwanted guests on board as well and here's the train in 1950s you know uh with a4 on the front in newcastle even then it's still a symbol a tradiga branch of the nur you know you've got this beautiful illuminated address what do they use as a locomotive flying scotsman if you're in, in a in a um, orphanage flying scotsman again and here's Wellin 
finally you get modernization coming along. He's well in in 1959, flying Scotsman coming out the tunnels. Not everybody's happy. Um, and the vast majority of the early 1960s experienced a continuation of the 50s. Britain remained an industrial society and apparently a world power. Andrew Marr's history of modern Britain is very good, actually. But, you know, not everybody's happy. This summarizes it to me very, very well, you know. Flying Scotsman running past a bit of graffiti. Nothing new about graffiti. Here's what took over on the diesel side. Well, initially it was class 40s. They were initially taught, called English electric type 4s, although the drivers reckoned they were rubbish and called them type 2.5s. And, uh, and they weren't happy until they got Deltics on the front. Um, and the 100th anniversary of the service had Deltic on the front. And finally... They'd upgraded the track so legitimately you could do 100 miles an hour. This is Lollum in 64. And they wanted to electrify it, but the money wasn't there, so they got the next best thing, which was very powerful diesel locomotives on the front, the Deltics. And the loco was up for scrapping. So a society formed to try and buy it in 62. Couldn't raise the money. So along came this chap, something of a character, Mr. Alan Pegler. He was, a, by this stage, a millionaire. And he buys it and he engages, because he's a businessman, he engages a London-based PR company. Nostalgia is growing, so time of very rapid change. And he quickly earns the purchase price of 3,000 quid back. Don't be fooled that he, he went bankrupt because he owned Flying Scotsman. That's not the reason he went bankrupt. And if you think about Flying Scotsman uh, um, and the, um, the product life cycle, well, the, the locomotive gets a a new lease of life at this point in its life, whereas the train starts dropping away because it's accelerated anyway and we're moving into the corporate era. And Pegler does all he can to build up that image, even running a non-stop in 1968, the uh, non-stop service. And the BBC get on board, and you can see this film on their, on their, um, on their iPlayer, which is called 4472, what are they? do for a train that simulates the end of the steam edge, they use Flying Scotsman. They actually booked the last carriage in this train. They had four helicopters and two camera crews to make this film. Um, and here's John Noakes with Flying Scotsman. And they featured this on Blue Peter, which was just about the most leading uh, uh, children's channel at the time, in response to views letters about the scrapping of stream steam trains. This was a common sight. And as the BBC put in that uh, documentary, the steam locomotive is one of the most potent symbols of an era of both ruthless prosperity and bitter struggle. And they first broadcast that uh, documentary August the 11th, 1968. And enthusiasts will immediately tell you what that date means. It's the running of the 15 guinea special happened on that date. So you, if you're out photographing the last steam train run by BR, then there you are, you go home, you turn the telly on, and there's Flying Scotsman. And if you're lucky to be up on the train and you've paid your 15 guineas, um, you can post a letter on the train, and what's on the letter? Flying Scotsman. So it's a symbol of steam. And you think about 68, it's a difficult period of time, a lot of bad things going on. The M1's open throughout, so you can drive up there in your Vauxhall Victor and blow the front end of the, uh, of the engine out because you're going too fast. Uh, equal pay strike at Ford's Dagenham. Um, you know, Enoch Pell doing his Rivers of Blood speech. Not a happy time. There's a near revolution in, in France. There is a revolution in Prague, which the Soviets jump on as fast as they can. So it's, you know, difficult period of time. So, you know, if you're in... Um, in America, watching Vietnam War is a Tet Offensive. No, it's, it's difficult, 1968. What's your good news story? A kind of neutral story? Fly Scotsman. And lo and behold, after August 68, Pegler's got this deal. He can run it anywhere he likes, as long as he pays for the coal and the crew. So here it is in Lincoln in 1969. It's the last mainline steam locomotive running on the network. He decides to take it to the States, to America, to do a buy British campaign in 69. So it only runs for about a year or so. And here he's dolled up in Doncaster Works, ready to go to the States. Um, they take it to Liverpool and um, ship it to America. And he goes over there, 
launching a, a buy British campaign. It's regarded by one uh, journalist as the weirdest buy British campaign he's ever seen. He's got a over 40 years old locomotive on the front in a place that's trying to modernize. Uh, you can buy a suit of armor on board. You can buy tickets to uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, I mean, obviously, they had BSA motorcycles, pretty polytypes, all sorts of things on board. Um, and then they had an accompanying promotion, which had two uh, Bristol low-decker buses with, a, with nine uh, mini-skirted girls on board who'd been uh, recruited from the finest nightclubs of Spain to sell goods to the Americans. Um, when that particular company went bust, uh, Pegler, who was a little bit of a ladies' man, uh, decided that the girls, you know, didn't need to go home. Perhaps they could get on board the train, and they did. And they had the time of their lives traveling through America, selling products uh, to Americans and just going to millionaires' parties. So that was Scotsman in America. But of course, Pegler didn't want to go home. He was going through his uh, at the end of his fourth marriage. He could drive his, his locomotive anywhere, which he wasn't supposed to do in the UK. So he didn't want to go home. So he basically drove around America, eventually takes his loco to San Francisco, by which stage he's using something like four credit cards to pay off the bills and being pursued by uh, debt collectors as he steams out of each particular town in the Midwest. Um, and he goes bust. Uh, and he pulls some strings and locks the loco away in uh, an army base in, in America. Of course, this is all headline news. So poor old BR, who's running Deltics on air-conditioned services and then HSDs on air-conditioned services, you know, it's not really surprising that the flag Scotsman as a name starts fading away. They start promoting other benefits of traveling by train because the headlines are going with this, uh, you know, this kettle over in the States. When they bring it back in 72 and it gets bought, rescued from America, gets bought by uh, Sir William McAlpine, uh, he's an, he was an enthusiast, uh, he died last year sadly, um, great enthusiast, um, he brings it back, but it's rescued from America, bit, bit odd that, but it's a good news story, it's a national good news story. They actually turn out primary schools to see it go by when it steams back from the docks, and the RAF do a run past over it, and it's headline news on the news. So. Again, if you think about this period of time, you know, it's 72, 73, it's an odd period of time. There's, you know, there's an oil crisis goes on. There are power cuts. It's a three-day week. Heath, you know, standing up. The IRA bombing campaign at its height, you know. Odd period of time. So you probably in Britain needs a good news story. And there's this green locomotive that's come back from the States. Um, actually, if you wanted to relax, there was one other thing that came along in that period of time, and that was the first broadcast of Last of the Summer Wine. So it's okay. Don't worry about the IRA, you've got Foggy on the telly. And again, you're back to all the product placement. You can buy an LP so you can listen, you know, sit at home listening to Scotsman Stateside on your, on, on your stereo. Uh, you can buy jigsaws. There's, they print a commemorative mug to, to put the 50th anniversary the Silver Jubilee Flying Scotsman 1983 of the locomotive. Um, they actually stopped for water at Newark on that in 1983 and closed the East Coast Bay Line. There are so many people turning out to see the locomotive. The locomotive is a celeb, no question about it. It's so much of a celeb that when they have problems with wind scale and they decide to rename it Sellafield and have a, um, a visitor centre there, and you remember the nuclear power no thanks uh, uh, promotions, 1987, Science Museum Group build a, a visitor centre. How do they do it? Well, they get Flying Scotsman on the front of a train, and you can see two of Britain's biggest crowd pullers in one day. So you can go on Flying Scotsman uh, out to Sellafield. And this is what McAlpine says at this time, I never really felt I owned it. I really believed I held it in trust for people who loved it, which people did. 88, they take it to Australia once they've established that the people in Australia have got the money to ship it home again. Um, and one guy pays for it to go all the way to Perth, Western Australia. So here it is in Perth, Western Australia. By the way, both of these locomotives are in steam. Uh, you know, don't try this at home, folks. Um, and um, it goes all, all across America, uh, Australia. Um, 
even goes to the Red Heart of Australia. There's a great photograph of it, the Red Heart of Australia, where it's welcomed by the local Aboriginals who actually do a ceremony, which most people there didn't realise what they were actually saying. What they were saying was, you are welcome to this, this is our land which was quite a radical thing. Mabo Declaration comes around that time. So Flying Scotsman is one of the very few artefacts that has been linked to the space race and the oldest living culture on the planet. Um, interesting thing. By the time you get to 1997, um, McAlpine in the middle there has decided to sell on. Well, it's a bit mixed because at that stage, the locomotive is owned by a company that's jointly owned between McAlpine uh, and Pete Waterman. Uh, and um, they sell it to um, uh, Tony Marchington, the gentleman on the right, who made a lot of money out of super drug and things because he's a chemist. He'd made the kind of aspirin that, you know, what didn't say aspirin on the box, that kind of thing. And um, uh, he... Uh, he, just, he was a big enthusiast, steam enthusiast. He owned traction engines, all the rest of it. And uh, he bought Flying Scotsman uh, and decided to do it up. And then he decided that Flying Scotsman was the biggest unexploited brand in the world. So he sold shares in it on the Offex market. This is 2002. Um, uh, Tony, uh, I don't think, was best served by the people that, that uh, surrounded Scotsman at that time because uh, they ran through an awful lot of money very quickly, even though the locomotive was actually, it had been restored to working order and actually over-restored in many respects for such an old machine. They'd re the cylinders, uh, 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 pushed up the pressure in the locomotive boiler, and it was outperforming what it had ever done before, really, um, which was causing it something of a problem. But nonetheless, it... it delivered all the trains it was supposed to deliver um uh, but money was disappearing and it got to the point where they decided the company by which stage tony had parted company with the company decided to sell a locomotive and the uh, we had the save our scotsman this is the um, um editor of um of uh, railway magazine at the time saying saying uh, the future of the world's most famous locomotive uh, the alternative is to see it go abroad or fall into the wrong hands. I'm not quite sure what the wrong hands means, or go abroad. What does he mean? Well, I think he means America, actually. But uh, I think uh, it, the, one of the plans was sell it to Disney anyway, actually. But um, anyway, here it is, and the Rowing Museum steps in, gets a lot of support to buy it. Uh, the route carries on, and one of the very first talks in the privatization process, 96, GNR, calls it the route of the Flying Scotsman. Lo Locomotive Flying Scotsman, once the Rome Museum gets it, is in very sad order. I could tell you some stories about that, but they run it for a couple of years. By the way, here it is in York, and uh, the HST on the left-hand side, of course, has ran the service on the East Coast Main Line, something like five times longer than Flying Scotsman ever did. Um, finally, we get to the restoration of Flying Scotsman, um, and it takes a long time because that is a severely tired 90 plus year old locomotive. Uh, and in the end, uh, a third of the frames has to be replaced. The boiler, major work done to it, mm, an awful lot of components replaced. And the best thing you can say, you're preserving a working machine's relationship to man rather than freezing the object at a motor moment in time. Uh, it's like performing surgery, open heart surgery on a 90 year old. And when it relaunches in 2016, it completely shocks some of the press people by how many people are interested. Um, I was doing uh, interviews for the museum from about quarter to six in the morning till about quarter past ten at night about Flying Scotsman. Um, and I talked to one of the uh, people and said, well, everybody's got Scotsman fever, really. Um, People turned up, people asked for lumps of coal off the tender. Um, and of course, not really surprised by 2015, the tops the pole, best known trains and locomotives. And we're back to, you can get products, Flying Scotsman. It does very well for the museum. It's shop in the retail side. So it's a hundred, one thousand, so say this again, 
102,000 uh, £102, ahead of our previous um, sales. You think about nostalgia, your sentimental yearning for the happiness of a former place. Um, and all the stuff you can get. I'm just winding up here. All the stuff you can get from Flying Scots, all the memorabilia, it's all out there. Who buys it? Good question, because it's available. You only need to put that name on. Hey, day trips from York. Go and see the Flying Scots one on North Yorkshire Moors Railway. It's, you know, just, it's all there. And if you think of nostalgia, Britain has a huge amount of heritage railways because of that nostalgia for steam locomotives and all all that and wrapped up in that is flying scotsman by the way these are big economic drivers for the areas in which they're placed so it's quite important they survive covid but nonetheless that nostalgia for steam is there however it's worth saying that as a as a brand not in copyright not all products reinforce brand values this is the Flying Scotsman snow shaker uh, with the train moves around the bottom. You might want one of those. Um, uh, and, um, well, it's unlikely your, your aunt will buy you this for Christmas, but if they do, they probably don't like you. Anyway. <laughs> it got to the point where it became a meme. It became, you know, out in Twitter. Uh, I trended on Twitter once based on Flying Scotsman, but here we are on Twitter. People got responses back, Virgin Trains got responses back saying, oh yeah, I'll shovel a bit of coal for a cheaper train ticket. You're thinking, this was put out on the 1st of April 2016 in the morning. Um, come on, guys, wake up a little bit. Mind you, if you read a lot of Twitter, that uh, that's not really a surprise, but there we are. Um, oh, you can get this. Um, it's a little out of gauge, I would say, this Flying Scotsman, but never mind, um, You'll lose your teddy and all, all your presents through the f first bridge you go through. But never mind, you can buy this. It's one of those things which you can buy on subscription. Plays uh, a medley of beloved Christmas melodies. So presumably it doesn't play Flying Scotsman coming out of the tunnels coming up from King's Cross, which, you know, a bit of a shame really, but there we are. Um, all of these products are there. So you can get Flying Scotsman products from the cradle, almost, to, well, to the grave, really. And if you think about it, Flying Scotsman has built that reputation over that period of time, but it's that core building in the interwar period at its best. And that's when the brand is built up, but then it's rebuilt by the owners of Flying Scotsman when it becomes a private locomotive at the point where nostalgia starts to boom. Now, I went out to see Flying Scotsman come up uh, on the North Yorkshire Miles Railway in 2016. And everybody was out there trying to get a photograph near the summit of the line, if you know the line. And here they are. They were all over the place. I've never seen a traffic jam on the North Yorkshire Moors ever before. And I doubt I'll ever see it again. Uh, it was quite funny because I'd be bike with me. I just cycled past this line of cars thinking this is going to be interesting when they try and go home. Uh, anyway. Going back to that photograph, everybody was out there to take a photograph of Flying Scotsman. All the photograph they wanted was this one. And you'll notice with this one, there's nobody in the picture apart from Flying Scotsman. So, you know, almost perfect, apart from the fact it's got a, a great Western, uh, you know, inspector slew directly behind the tender. But, you know, that's, you know, that's heritage railways for you. So there is Flying Scotsman, the famous. So... Um, how Flying Scotsman the locomotive became famous is one thing, very definitely one thing, you know, and I hope I've explained that to you tonight. What this says about Britain in the 21st century is a very different question. And actually, I wasn't going to do it, but I think I will. I'll end with this. Uh, by the way, you can buy my little book on this, and it's 20,000 words. You can get it off a box for about 50p, and it'll explain that what I've told you. But this is how I'll end. Nostalgia, the best take on nostalgia I've ever come across is, of course, Houseman. Into my heart, an air that kills from yon far country blows. What are those blue remembered hills? What spires? What farms are those? That is the land of lost content. I see it shining plain. The happy highways where I went and cannot come again. OK, thanks for listening.
Oh, thank you, Bob. That's wonderful. And I was going to give you a plug for your book as, as soon as you finished. And there you are. <laughs> well, we've got questions coming in, but I'm going to steal the first question. Yeah. Because uh, one of the points about Flying Scotsman is that it's almost as colourful as its owners. Um, perhaps you'd like to say something about Pegler's acquisition of the Flying Scotsman from uh, uh uh, British Railways, as it perhaps they well, 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 Pegler was um, his family affair owned Northern Rubber, uh, and um, he was also therefore uh, uh, on the board of the Eastern Region of BR as the uh, industry representative. And uh, he ran, he, he did specials and things. And um, uh, when Scotsman was available for sale, he decided he would buy it. Uh, just at that moment, of course, the uh, the system changes and Dr. Richard Beeching uh, comes in, uh, the arch modernizer, and Beeching actually sacks him from the board. And Pegler goes into his office a while later and says, did you sack me because I bought Flag Scotsman? And Beeching says, well, frankly, yes. Um, who was right in that situation? Well, you can see Beeching's point of view. He's trying to modernize the railway. He brings an intercity freight liner, a number of other things, and um, Pegler's playing trains. Pegler, of course, was something of a character. He was an officer commander in the Royal Observer Corps. He'd been in the uh, Royal Fleet Air Arm. Uh, he had four wives um, and um, something of a character. Um, when he's in the States, he's having an absolute ball at the point where he's going into his uh, divorce of his, his his fourth marriage, so he he stays in America. Uh, McAlpine, a much more genial chap, very nice chap, um, buys it and spends the money on it. Quite, it it looks after itself in many respects, but he spends money when he needs to, and he has a few rides on it. And he can't believe how popular it is when he's in Australia. At one stage, somebody rushes up to him in Alice Springs and gives him a big hug. And he's going, what, 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 what? And it's, it's it, thanks for bringing this to Australia. Can't believe it. And, um, and then, of course, um, they get into difficulties around the time of privatization and um, get sold to Tony Marchington. And Marchington, um, his dad runs the, um, the, the, a, 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 a agricultural show in the middle of the... Um, 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 Peak District, miles from a, a railway line, and they decide to take Flying Scotsman there, and they put it in the middle of this agricultural show, on a track, so his dad can, uh, you know, have something extra for his show. It misses about three contracted turns hauling the British Pullman train, <laughs> which uh, they fall out a bit with him over that. Uh, and I asked Tony March, and I actually asked him, said that. How do you get away from with that? That is actually in the middle of a national park. You laid track on a farmer's field in the national park. And he said, oh, amazing what slurry can cover. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so, you know, then finally the Rowing Museum buys it and it has to undo really a great deal of hidden neglect to get it back to work in order and in actual fact now it's probably better than it ever has been but that comes on to a question from mike dyson how much is original i.e built in 1923-24 and how uh, we, much is it's, it's like adam's shovel isn't it uh yeah we we, we think uh the brass fairings around the uh the splashes uh part of the uh the cab sheets um and one or two other components um, are stamped 1472, but there isn't an awful lot of that that is 4472. Um, there isn't, is 1472, There's not an awful lot of it. If you like, it doesn't matter because it's retaining the spirit of something rather than the actuality of it. Uh, and in fact, with a steam engine, they're all really the spirit of something because um, you things wear out and the LNR you know, frequently replaced frames, replaced boilers, replaced wheels. Uh, casting spoke wheels w wasn't really a, a great art. Um, when they did flying squats and uh, um, restoration, they found to their surprise some of the spokes were cracked. When they did investigations into it, they realized that the casting process um, um, meant that actually 
hollows appeared in locomotive spokes quite frequently. Uh, and they had to put out a call to all of them mainline locos, get your, get your wheels checked. They found at least one loco that had cracks in the spokes that nobody knew about. So, you know, it, it, it's one of those things. And, um, you know, it, it's a symbol of its period, uh, you know, of the whole steam age. And that's been built up, uh, as I hope I've explained. I may go back to Pegler and press you. Pegler got rather a good deal, didn't he? I mean, it's you. You showed it, I think, at the uh, Doncaster shed with with two tenders. Uh, well, no, he well he bought the ten, the second tender later. Uh, his his deal was quite impressive, really, because he initially bought it for three thousand quid. I don't know how many green shield stamps he got for that, but it was three thousand quid, and. Um, I think he'd probably get a washing machine. Anyway, and uh, he got a shed, his own locked shed, uh, and as long as he paid for the cruise, he could steam it anywhere. And the, the contract carried on um, past 1968. Um, and, um, and then they got loads of parts, and then the chief mechanical engineer of, uh, of BR, Terry Miller, who's accredited with the high-speed train miller of course had run haymarket shed in in uh, steam days and miller knew all the lnr the stuff and he said buy a new um buy a new boiler for it because you'll need it in the end and uh, a new set of uh, cylinders which is what they did so um, yeah he had all the right advice uh, and uh, the right friends really um friends in high places because of course when he gets to the states um he knew millionaires over there and so on. And he pulled strings. If you think about it, when he goes bust in San Francisco, that loco gets moved to an army base. Yes. It's a guarded army base. How does his creditors get to there to slap a writ on, writ on the side? They don't. Um, and in fact, when I just got to say this, when McAlpine buys it, they send uh, George Hinchcliffe over there to buy it. And Hinchcliffe doesn't know if they've paid off enough creditors. They get it on the quayside in San Francisco, shipping it onto a boat to sail back to the, to the UK. And he's not sure whether all the creditors have paid off. And then somebody from the local newspaper, the San Francisco Chronicle, turns up on the quayside. He thinks, well, what am I going to do here? I don't want him reporting this. And I, I, he was live at the, you know, to the, into his 90s. And I asked him, well, what did you do? He said, oh, it was simple, really. He was a journalist, wasn't he? I got him drunk. Uh, so they, they got this guy drunk so he couldn't file copy. They put the engine on the boat. The boat sailed. And George Hinchcliffe actually said, I didn't, I didn't, I breathed a sigh of relief when we, we cleared US territorial waters. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, I, um, I mean, um, they, they were all characters in, involved with, with, this en with this engine. Uh, the only characters involved with it now are some of the support crew who are um, entertaining in their own right. Uh, uh, some of the drivers are pretty good as well. But um, anyway, uh, there must be some technical questions out there, I, I would assume. Well, um, no, you, you, you've been let off the hook there. Sparshot, um, someone's asking, I mean, he in a sense became the, a celebrity himself, didn't he? Oh yes, uh, uh, yeah. William Sparshat, it is actually yeah, the, right. the the family uh, family prefer it as Sparshot, but it's it's the, in the thirties. It's Sparshat. Yeah, I mean to say um, that run to uh, uh, Leeds, where on the way back they do a hundred miles an hour. Um, he apparently said to the platform enders in uh, Kings Cross, "If we hit anything today, we'll hit it hard." Uh, he. Um, I mean, he drove, he was a fast driver. Apparently, he regarded him something of self as something of celebrity, so much so that one um, uh, contact I, I, I spoke to was, who knew somebody who'd been around at the time said, yeah, apparently he didn't oil around. He got somebody on the shed to do that. He didn't only do any of the mucky work. Um, and he actually resigns. He takes early retirement uh, in the mid-30s um, after that. And it's because probably he nearly sideswiped a loco having misread the signals at North Allerton. Um, and actually this gets reported that he's retired in the LNER magazine. But the person who reports it 
uh, signs himself off as 4471, which is um, Green Arrow. So he doesn't even put his name to this thing, you know, famous driver, blah, 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 has retired. And then you put two and two together. Sparshot was in charge of that loco. The famous, um, it's not named, but it's a famous incident where there's nearly a, a, a near miss. And the, there's misread the signals, and it's only the driver coming up the main East Coast main line who sees as this bloke has misread the signals and puts the anchors on that they didn't have an accident. And Sparshot then retires. So he's treated leniently, uh, really, um, even though first guy to sit in the seat in the UK and legitimately do 100 miles an hour. Right. And, and tell us more about the, um, the, I mean, there are lots of wonderful asides in your, in your talk. One of them is this, um, is this diesel hydraulic locomotive at Scarborough. I mean, is it still running? And, and who built that? Diesel hydraulic. Oh, that yeah, that's still running. That's the North Bay Railway, Scarborough. Yeah, um, yeah. If you think about the North Bay Railway, they started off with three of those. Um, one was called Titan. I can't remember the other names. I mean, you can get that to the Sea Life Centre. The guy who runs it is a not really nice bloke, he, he, uh, David Humphreys. And um, uh, yeah, it's still running. It's the oldest diesel hydraulic in the world. Um, and um, it, quite funny, really. People have got so used to steam now, the nostalgia. Uh, things turn full circle so that uh, David Humphreys decided the railway needed a steam locomotive so we had one built uh, only in the last five years um, and you can now do a driver experience on the North Bay Railway steam powered which only was available in the 21st century even though the, the railway is one of the oldest of those um, uh, pleasure railways um, you know by you know by the seaside which always got to me, actually, you go on holiday by train uh, and then one of the things you do as an excursion is to go on a, a smaller train for a journey. Um, this kind of shows how much embedded uh, railways are in the UK. I was thinking there's a Hudswell Clark were involved, were they? Uh, with yeah, it's a Hudswell Clark, yes it is, yeah. Yeah, it must have been quite early for them. Um, uh, they'd have been getting into industry, I think, at that stage. Um, of course, Gresley uh, himself looked into building a, uh, a diesel electric uh, for the Fern Park coal trains. You get this on a different talk of mine, but uh, I, I think you folks have heard it. But the, you know, he looked into building, uh, but um, in the end, um, uh, the locomotive, the, the diesel engine builders, uh, um, Beardmore's backed out because the um, the contract was a bit too stringent for them. Uh, so they backed out, so it was never built. And of course, uh, the Silver Jubilee came around because Gresley looked into um, uh, diesel rail cars for East Coast Main Line, only following on what Raven and people had done before and what he had experience of. Um, but really, at the end of the day, um, those rail cars, because diesel plant was large and heavy, were very spartan interiors so that they weren't happy with the interiors and their first class diners requested um, at seat service so the idea of being given a sausage and a small roll of bread and you know a glass of schnapps wasn't really it so they they built um they built the a4s instead um so um you know if you want to be really outrageous you can say the a4s came about because uh, Newcastle businessmen uh, wanted to have a dinner on a train. Yeah, I mean, I just pick up there. I mean, my interest in Hudswell Clark is because at the same time they were also making the uh, the casings for Britain's first atomic bomb, <laughs> and so they had this Thomas the Tank Engine image of supplying both tank engines and and uh, and ple engines for pleasure parks whilst uh, at the other end of the factory making uh, Britain's first nuclear weapon. <laughs> well, there's, there's plenty of Hudswell Clarks out there, I mean, steam and diesel, plenty of them around. Um, they tend, the, the diesels tend to be a bit clunky, I have to say, but, um, uh, you, know, the, you know, just part of that big manufacturing swathe that was supplying industry at that stage, um, which again makes you think that um, to get Scotsman as the premier steam locomotive um, is in its self-astonishing really i mean um you know if you asked out there everybody would have their favorites but 
uh, you know, you know, personally, if you're talking steam mainline locomotives, give me a black five anytime. You know, you can take it anywhere. It'll do 90 mile an hour. You know, apart from the fact that the uh, the, the stadia backhead is a bit awkward and the drivers only have a piece of wooden board to sit on, it's not bad. So put some Gresley seats in it and it, it'd be fine. But the, uh, you know, again, uh, Gresley again, ergonomics, he thought about that. He was friends with Chaperon in France. So, you know, it's, it, it's, it's quite a sophisticated machine. But it's 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 Teasdale uh, and um, and that that burst of, of of promotion that really gets it on the map. Can, can we tie in Gresley and and the publicity? I mean, how far was Gresley promoting his own interests when he dis, when, when he sanctioned the huge public relations effort at LNER? Well, I mean, he wasn't on the board, was he? He was, he was the chief mechanical engineer. I mean, Teasdale was the assistant manager and, uh, you know, the guy below him was doing all that work. He would have liked it because, um, you know, he was kind of used to knocking around and seeing things and um, didn't do him any harm, really. You know, he, no. got, you know, he got honorary, um, honorary doctorate from somewhere and so on. He eventually got a knighthood. So, you know, it, it didn't do him any harm at all. And he was one of those guys, they called him the Great White Chief on the railways. Uh, and he, he built up a following amongst his, his men, as it were, and they were all men. Um, and the thing about him was that um, he would have liked all that. And you have to remember as well, I think this is quite an important point, because his wife dies of cancer in 1929. So he becomes a bit of a workaholic after that. I mean, it's rumoured he becomes an alcoholic, but he becomes a workaholic. So, you know, he's, that's his family. I mean, he has got, yeah. so, so, has got sons and daughters, you know, but, you know, really the railway, the LNER becomes his family. So he's going to do everything he can to sure. make sure it's, it's promoted. Yes. I mean, it, 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 there's no doubt about it. It was public relations genius. Yeah, well, it, it, it's time. It, it, well, it, it shows you how far it spread uh, and the fact that the other people are trying to catch up, you know, or they're often playing catch up, really. So yes. much so that the, you know, the, um, uh, if you think about the nonstop run, they send that train out three days ahead of it to kind of spoil the, the, the pre press. But they've already, the LNR has already got the, the times and people in the, in the palm of their hands. <laughs> Well, uh, and, the pub. <laughs> well, whatever, probably the pub, but palm in the hands. Um, it's actually, the, the, there's a guy running uh, the photo department by that stage who's, um, he's actually De Bogart's dad, but that's another story. And um, anyway, they've got the palm in the hands. And what they're doing is, is making sure that this is out there as much as it possibly can, even though quite a lot of their services are substandard. And you can, you can experience this. You can go on the North Norfolk Railway and get in their quad art set, which was used on suburban trains in and out of London into the late 1950s, early 1960s. It's so narrow. You've got to interweave your knees with the person opposite. <laughs> uh, you know, and, you know, you know, all that art deco interior, that's the top of the range. Yeah, sure. First of you, know, uh, uh, you know, and actually they're trying to sprinkle a bit of magic fairy dust over quite a lot of their network, which is not really doing very well. Uh, and of course, um, Presley's going to be a part of that because, you know, um, uh, it's, you know, it's nothing like walking into a meeting, and getting applauded for having had your loco do 100 miles an hour, mm. even though it required, it required a driver who was prepared to just push it to the absolute limits and uh, a, a lot of careful working on behalf of signaling and, and control. Um, because uh, it is shocking to think, even though um, by that stage in-camp signaling uh, systems were coming in, they weren't fitted to those locos at all. And um, the quality of the rail wasn't up to much. I'm talking well, of quality, um, I've got a question in, about the philosophy of restoration at the National Railway Museum. I mean, how far do you adopt modern materials, for example, 
Well, well you don't have you don't you don't have any choice with some materials um, because you know this is post nuclear age, so the steel is not the same. But um, they had to wait more than a year to get the firebox copper from um, from China because they were the only people who produced the right copper with the right amount of arsenic in it. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So that was one thing they had to you know, had to deal with uh, correctly. The other steels and so on would be modern steels. The restoration, the reason it's running around the 60103 is because it's really as close as you can get it for the peak performance it delivers with a double chimney and, um, and uh, an a A3 boiler like that. Um, Pegler ran it around in LNER Apple Green and he changed the double chimney for a single chimney. Um, but actually, once it it can't be looking like an A1 because the boiler barrel was not really wide up, wide enough for the for the superheat header that they, they fitted to make them A3. Which is why those LNER engines have got those funny little kind of black ears near yep. the front of them. Yep. Um, so to get it back to A1 condition, which would be unwise, by the way, because it wasn't really very good. Um, uh, <laughs> You know, you'd have to re—you'd have to basically give yourself a new boiler, um, and the old boiler—it's um, got a new firebox and some new plate work, but it's—it's—it's it's, um, it's mostly um, the original steel on it. So it's not very easy to get a, a working machine. And in the end, if you're going to compromise with any machine, Scotsman is it because over its lifetime, it's had lots and lots and lots of those modifications. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's quite a, a profound philosophical issue, isn't it? It's not at all straightforward. Well, no, I mean, there's an unfortunate thing with um, the Rowie Museum is that um, because Rowies are, are domestic items and used every day, they're not treated the same as if you went and looked at a, 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 a pile of paintings in an art gallery. So a good example is uh, Queen Victoria's carriage, which is 1863, something like that. Every single person who walks up to that carriage tries the doors. Yep. Even though if you said to people, look, if every pe person who came through the museum's door, which is about 700,000 in the course of a year, walked through this carriage, about two years, there would be no carriage left. Yeah, sure. And if you keep wanging on those handles, you'll break the handle. Doesn't matter. It's a carriage. Surely you can get on it. Um, so it's, it's a really, in the end, um, there are certain locomotives which would never be restored to work in order, and certain ones, because of the way their life has been, we kind of allow it. So, um, well, we allow it. Yes, but I mean, this, it, is, but, this, this overlaps with people like Michael Bailey's research on the archaeology of early locos and the fact that they essentially unpicking a sequence of modifications and updating and uprating and design changes and uh, new bolt-on goodies and they're trying to take it back to where it was yeah yeah well it's very important work that because it actually tells you an awful lot about the early railway and about to a degree how harem scarum it was how kind of nobody quite knew what they were doing and they certainly didn't know the science of materials and that's one of the things that people have uh, kind of forgotten you know everybody goes oh it's brilliant victorian engineering well what could they do they could build a roman arch because people have been roman, building roman arches in the uk since roman times so you know so you've got a, a viaduct that is it's built like the proverbial brick outhouse yes and it's not really a surprise that by the 1960s you can be running something that weighs you know 180 tons over it when the first locos weighed 40 if you're lucky sure. um, so you know it, it's there's there's a lot of that going on and the, again it's another thing with the with the longevity of the railway and um people's familiarity with it that that language kind of hinders it this current COVID crisis, the, uh, the transport secretary came out with the line that, um, oh, it's okay, um, there'll be so many people travelling over those five days over Christmas that we'll just lengthen the carriages. 
lengthen the carriages. At least that's how it was reported. It was like, lengthen, what? I mean, okay, I'm going to go outside and lengthen my car. I've got a, you know, I've got a, I've got an oxyacetylene torch and a, and a welding kit which I bought from the center aisle in Lidl. I'll do it. No problem. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just that kind of thing. It's like, and you hear people on trains which are very busy saying, oh, they should put on some more carriages. Where from? Yes. You know, I mean, it's that kind of thing that, that, that um, it's a folk memory of a railway that's gone. Yeah. Um, and Flying Scotsman locks you back into that straight away. Um, Can I pursue this issue? Because John Clayson, for instance, asks uh, uh, and raises this point. Hello, about, John. <laughs> raises this point about uh, uh, rails, that in many respects, the modern railway is not only safer, but it must also be much kinder to steam locomotives. I mean, you don't have fish plates and joints. Oh, you yes. Have far better alignments and oh, uh, yes. fewer yes. turnouts yeah. and possibly yeah. fewer points, I would suspect. It, it, yeah. Is that yeah. the case? It is, because, I mean, to say, um, uh, if you think of Mallard's record run uh, in 1938, when it came off the top of the bank by um, Little Bytham there, as it's approaching Peterborough, it's going over some 40-foot lengths, which, which were rolled in the 1890s. Yeah, sure. Um, they don't have super elevation in those days. They, you know, you know the rails are what, two, three miles long, something like that? Well, you know, Easy. Yep. By, by the time they're welded together. So a lot kinder, less broken springs. If you want to see broken springs on a railway, just go to a preserved railway. And, uh, and observe just how well their P-way actually is, even at 25 miles an hour. Sure. Um, and they're more likely to have broken springs than, um, than one, of, one of a local like Flying Scotsman. And the other thing with the uh, mainline excursions is, of course, they're asking some of these engines to do something they never did in steam days. You know, they'll hang 10, 11 coaches off a black you five. Make money. Well, the, the problem is that they, they're actually overloading these locos. <laughs> Go out, you know, you're, you know you're, you're only 70 years old. Go and pull that train that's about four carriages longer than you would normally have done when you were only 40. Yeah. But nobody ever says that, you know. Be, you know, uh, and so it's, you know, people get into this kind of weird nostalgia for a past, you know, that really never existed i mean i was stood next to scotsman once in york and there was a lad there in his early 20s taking a picture on his on his phone of course so he could put it on any one of a number of social media platforms i said are you interested in this he said, oh is it great wouldn't it be great if all the trains to london were like this and i said to him so oh, yeah you, you know four or five hours to london you don't mind that and stopping about um at least four times yeah, yeah. Uh, and by the way, you might want to wear a different set of clothes. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, but, it don't you know, <laughs> I mean, the best, uh, the best comment I've ever had for me personally was because I am an enthusiast. I like seeing these things, but you've got to recognize how much out of time they are. Uh, and that, that's a bit like watching the Padstow hobby horse or watching people chase you know, rolls of cheese downhill in Gloucestershire. It's out of its time by a long way now. Yeah. So um, this comment was by a, a driver on a preserved railway, and I happened to be on the footplate, and we're chuffing along about 15 miles an hour, and the fireman's shoveling coal in the fire. And he turns to me and he says, what are we doing playing with these rock-burning monsters in this day and age? <laughs> Well, I think that's a perfect that's a perfect question <laughs> on which to finish, Bob, because <laughs> that precisely sums up the whole uh, the whole issue of the current celebrity of flying Scotsman, doesn't it? Well, long may it steam, because it yes. is a lovely machine. I have to say yeah. that. So we have to thank you for a, a, a truly wonderful evening. It's been uh, it's been absolutely delightful. The combination of social commentary on public relations, uh, the anecdotes that have me laughing all the way, and the sheer depth of technical knowledge, which is formidable. 
So Bob, thank you very much indeed. We've, we've still held our audience, so I'm sure there'll be lots of people applauding at home. All right, well, have a Merry Christmas one and all. Yes, Happy Christmas. And thank you to you all for watching and, and listening and sending in the questions. Thank you very much.